Hello and welcome to the show that has no name. I am your host, Panyo Basa. And uh, I suppose that this show could have a name in that it's part of a mini-series that I've started on studies in archaic Buddhism. And in this episode, I'm going to discuss two more suttas from the Atakawaga, the Magandhya Sutta and the Pura Beda Suttas. Although, uh, first I should uh, just ramble a little bit with some intro. And uh, I've already done this this whole video once before last weekend. And I was like sleepy and low energy and was kind of disorganized in my mind and furthermore I forgot to mention one of the most important points of the Pura Beda Sutta and so I decided to just do it all over again today and so I'm sitting here fully caffeinated just right at the verge of almost being jittery and uh, it's a rainy spring day and I'm just going to uh, sit here and talk about the Magandhya and Pura Beda Suttas uh, in particular, and the Ataka Waga in general. Um, although this this mini series is not going to exclusively deal with suttas from the Ataka Waga, I don't want people to get the idea that the only really archaic texts are found only in the Ataka Waga of the Sutta Nipata, or in the the Sutta Nipata in general. Even though the Sutta Nipata is, um, it has a very high percentage relatively speaking, of really ancient, old Buddhist texts, like pre-Theravadan texts. So, before I, I really get started on the Magandhya and Purabeda Suttas, I suppose for those of you who didn't watch the, the previous installment of this mini-series, or who just have, like, bad memories, um, I'll just do a, a brief review of the evidence suggesting that the Ataka Waga of the Sutta Nipata is very, very ancient. And, I mean, even before that, I might as well mention that the Ataka Waga, the meaning of Ataka Waga is, it's like the chapter of eights or the section of octads, because the core of the Ataka Waga is a small group of suttas that have eight verses each. And I just held up four fingers for some reason. So it's like they're they're all called Ataka Suttas, like the uh, Paramataka Sutta. Uh, so the the Mahayana Buddhists who also have uh, versions of the Ataka Waga, a lot of them mistranslated the Ataka. They didn't get the eight reference, and so it became something like the Artaka Waga or the I can't remember what the Sanskrit word is for like deeper meaning, but they they used that as the translation. Mahayana Buddhists who translated like Proto-Pali into Sanskrit often made mistakes in their translations. Maybe they weren't very good at Sanskrit or something. But um, anyway, getting to the evidence of that the Atikawaga really is very ancient, like older than most Theravada Buddhist texts. First is the fact that some of the grammatical forms in the Ataka Waga are archaic. It's sort of like uh, proto-poly. There are some um, like noun declensions, it's called declensions I think, that uh, come closer to Vedic Sanskrit than to what is now like the streamlined standardized poly of most of the texts and the commentarial tradition. So that's evidence that it's it's really old that it's got like these archaic word forms. It's sort of like um, like 17th or 18th century English compared to modern English. And I suppose the main reason for that is because most of the Ataka Waga is, oh, I think maybe even all of the Ataka Waga is poetry. And poetry is more conservative. It's harder to change words because you might mess up the meter or something. So that's the first bit of evidence. The second is that the Ataka Waga is mentioned by name in other parts of the Tipitaka. For example, in the Vinaya, uh, or the, the Books of Monastic Discipline, and also in the Udana, which contains a lot of ancient uh, material also, like really, like relatively more ancient material. It's mentioned uh, by name in the story of a, a monk named Sona Kudikana, who meets the Buddha 
and the Buddha asks him to recite some Dhamma, and so Sona Kudikana recites the Atikawaga. And in the Udana version of the story, it even specifies that there are 16 suttas in the Atikawaga, which is correct. So there's that too. So this indicates that the Atikawaga itself is older than the text in which it is found, because of course it's described and mentioned by name and everything. So it's older than the completed version of the Vinaya Pitaka, and it's older than the completed version of the Udana, because it already existed by the time these other two bodies of literature were completed. So the other, or another um, bit of evidence is that the Atikawaga is one of the very few parts of the Pali Tipitaka that has a line-by-line -line commentary that is also canonical. The only other examples that I can think of would be the Patimoka, um, which is in the in the Winnie the, the It's like the standard core list of, of rules that monks and nuns have to follow. And also, there are a few other texts in the Sutta Nipata that have a line-by-line -line commentary that is so old that it's also canonical. And it's not just that it's old that caused this uh, commentary to be composed. It's because the Atikawaga is so old that it's pre-Orthodox. And so a lot of the teachings of the Atikawaga, as you'll find out when I read the suttas, or if you, if you don't know already, they're just pre-Theravadan. They're, they're just so old that they're not Orthodox. And so these commentaries had to be composed um, to sort of reinterpret the text to try to force fit them into the Orthodox system. So uh, the commentary to the Yataka Waga that I'm referring to is called the Mahanidesa. And it's a very obscure text. I don't think the Pali Text Society even has even bothered to have it translated into English because nobody really reads it. Anyone who appreciates the Atikawaga isn't going to appreciate the Mahane Desa very much as a general rule, just because it's like force fitting, like really straining the texts in order to try to make it fit the later Orthodox system. And it just doesn't ring true at all. So another bit of evidence, I'm looking at the, what the heck, what did I just do? Okay. Let's see here. Excuse me, <laughs> little technical glitch there. I touched the, the trackpad on the computer and made everything disappear. So another bit of evidence that the, uh, the Atikawaga is extremely old is that it is common to most, if not all, of the ancient schools of Buddhism. For example, even the Maha Sangika branch of Buddhism, which was a result of the first schism 100 years after the death of the Buddha, approximately. There was a, the first major schism in which you had the Stavira or Terra branch, and then you had the Mahasanga branch. And the Mahasanga branch also has their version of the Atikawaga, which is very similar to the Pali version or the Proto-Pali version. So that in itself is very good evidence that um, the Atikawaga predates the first schism, which uh, there, there are a lot of texts that predate it though, so it's not really that big of a deal. Let's see. Also, the Atikawaga has almost no stock passages. Like the, anyone who reads the Pali texts knows that there are these stock passages. For example, the, uh, the description of the four jhanas is verbatim the same almost everywhere you see it in the text. Also, the stock explanation for dependent core rising or Padicca Samuppada is just word for word exactly the same no matter where you find it. Or even um, like the conversion speech, like the Buddha will give uh, a sermon to some non-Buddhist. You know, he'll be teaching Dhamma to some non-Buddhist, and the non-Buddhist converts to Buddhism. And he'll say, excellent Master Gotama, excellent Master Gotama. And he'll give this speech about, you know, just how um, uh, Gotama, Buddha, had like turned a lamp right side up that had been upside down so that people can see shapes in, in the darkness, you know, this kind of thing. And it's exactly word for word the same speech. And it's extremely unlikely that everybody in the Buddha's time gave this exact same speech when they converted to Buddhism you know, in the presence of the Buddha and let him know it. And um, 
I have read that other schools of Buddhism also have their stock uh, speech that a convert gives, but it's different from the Theravadan version, which just indicates that um, Theravada Buddhist monks, when they're editing the texts, just put in just blocks of information where it seemed convenient to do so. And there, this is just almost completely lacking from the Antikawaga. There are a few repeated um, phrases, for example, and there's a little bit of mythology. Like there's no mention of fire-breathing cobra dragons or anything like that in the Antikawaga. It's mostly just pure philosophy. Although at the beginning of the Magandhya Sutta, which will be the first sutta that I read, um, there may be some mythology that got in there. It's, it's like in the intro, which isn't getting philosophical yet. So it could be a later edition, or it could be that the mythology got spun off from this obscure, um, this obscure reference in the, in the beginning of the Magandhya Sutta. And just so that people unfamiliar with the Magandhya Sutta don't get confused from the very first verse, um, I will kind of give a little of pre-commentary before I read the sutta, just so that you'll, you'll have a, a grounding of the origin story of this sutta. And according to the legend, the Buddha was meditating in a park one day, and it was near town or in town. He was just sitting under a tree in this park meditating, and he looked so majestic. He was of the aristocracy. He was a kshatriya of the warrior ruling caste, supposedly according to the legend. And he looked so noble and serene that this Brahmin who had a teenage daughter sees him and he just thinks, finally, at long last, there's, this guy's obviously good enough for my daughter. And he'd been turning down suitors to his daughter again and again, but finally he sees the guy who's good enough for her. So he brings his daughter to the Buddha and then the Buddha gives this little derogatory speech which includes, just what is this full of urine and dung? I would not want to touch it even with my foot. Which is, uh, I don't know, it's kind of a scandal, I suppose you could consider um, that the Buddha, who's an enlightened being, would talk such trash, <laughs> apparently, <laughs> to another person just to their face, you know. I mean, he even called this this girl it. You know, I wouldn't want to touch it, even my foot, this thing full of urine and dung. And the explanation in the commentaries is that it had such shock value that it, like, made the Brahmin father and his wife, who was also there, you know, the mother and father of this girl, it just kind of jolted them into this vulnerable or open state, you know, so this mild crisis, so that they became very receptive to the Dhamma that he was teaching them, and both of them became Aryas, or um, like low-level Buddhist saints, they became Sotapanas. But um, even the, the, the tradition says that the, the girl um, just hated the Buddha for the rest of her life, which is kind of understandable considering what he said about her. And I mean, she's like this raving beauty that, you know, all the guys are after. And he, finally, some, some guy that her father thinks is good enough for her, he just, he just calls her this thing full of urine and dung. So, um, anyway, so he, he says this about the girl and then the, the father, according to the legend, you know, he's asking him, you know, like, well, what do you teach if you're, if you're this advanced? And then that's the, that's the, the story of the sutta. Although, um, I can get into that a little bit later, how this may just be a convenient intro for, um, this sutta, because it is like really advanced kind of mind boggling sort of philosophy that, um, maybe the, the Buddha could just see into this Brahman and see that he was ripe for this, that he had parami or like, um, you know, he was latent advanced tendencies that he was ready for this sort of thing. But anyway, I'll start reading. And um, I'm being a little bit ambitious and uh, fancy, and I'm going to include screenshots of, of the text so that those of you who know Polly can actually see the Polly equivalents so you know that I'm just I'm not just making this stuff up because this sutta really is not orthodox Theravada by a long shot it comes closer to Mahayana in certain ways 
So, the first verse is by the Buddha, the second, and then it's sort of a back and forth between the Buddha and the questioner, who, according to tradition, was this Brahmin father. And, yeah, I, sh I should specify, I mean, I'm, I'm being rambly in this, this version, this second attempt also, but there's another Magandya Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya, which is completely different, and the Magandya in that version was a kind of ascetic philosopher. So it's a different different Magandhya. Maybe Magandhya was fairly common, like George or something. So anyway, this is Sutta 9 of the Atikawaga, Discourse to Magandhya, the Magandhya Sutta. Having seen craving, dissatisfaction, and passion, there did not occur even an inclination to sexuality. Just what is this, full of urine and dung? I would not want to touch it even with my foot. Then Magandhya speaks. If you do not want a treasure such as this, a woman desired by many lords of men, what belief, what morality and observances, what way of life, and what kind of rebirth into existence do you declare? There is nothing of which I say, I declare this, Magandhya, said the Blessed One, seized having discriminated from among the philosophies, but looking among the views, not taking hold of anything, examining, I saw inner peace. Whatever discriminations have been conceived, said Magandhya, truly, O oh sage, you speak of them without taking hold. This inner peace, whatever it means, how is it made known by the wise? Not by what is viewed, not by what is heard, not by inner knowledge, Magandhya, said the Blessed One, nor by morality and observances is purity said to be. By absence of what is viewed, by absence of what is heard, by non-knowledge, by amorality, by non-observance, also not by that. So having let go of these, not taking hold of anything, a peaceful one, not being dependent, would not have longings for existence. If you say that not by what is viewed, not by what is heard, not by inner knowledge, said Magandhya, nor by morality and observances is purity said to be, by absence of what is viewed, by absence of what is heard, by non-knowledge, by amorality, by non-observance, also not by that, then I imagine that to be a confused philosophy indeed. Some do rely on purity by view. And having depended upon view, inquiring, Magandhya, said the Blessed One, you have become confounded by what you have seized upon, and so you have not seen the slightest sense in this, therefore you hold it to be confused. He who imagines the existence of equal, superior, or inferior would contend with regard to that. To one not vacillating among three distinctions, there occurs no equal or superior. What would that holy man argue, saying, it is true? Or with, what, or with regard to what would he contend, saying, it is false? For whom there is neither equal nor unequal? For whom, with whom, would he engage in argument? A sage, having abandoned his home, going without fixed abode, not working up intimacies in a village, rid of objects of desire, setting nothing before him, would not take up a position and make debate with the people. From whatever things he has detached himself as he would roam through the world, not taking hold of them, a great one would not put forth an argument. Just as a white lotus whose stalk arises from the water is not mired by water and mud, even so a sage, a speaker of peace, one without greed, is not mired by sensuality in the world. One who has realized does not come to conceit through what is viewed or felt, for he is not made up of that. He is not to be led on by what is done or heard either. He is not brought to a conclusion among entrenchments. There are no ties for one dispassioned toward perception. There are no confusions for one released by understanding. But those who have grabbed hold of perception and view roam through the world causing trouble. And that is the end of the sutta. So I suppose I should come back and, and do a little commentary on this. Some parts of it, I am sure, will be confusing or just sort of mind-blowing, mind-boggling, whatever, to, to some people who, who hear or read this stuff. For example, I mean, just verse 3, 
where the Buddha is saying, there is nothing of which I say, I declare this. Seized having discriminated from among the philosophies. So, I mean, that in itself is already unorthodox. You're getting into like proto Majamaka philosophy here, which is a kind of like Mahayana philosophy, where the Buddha is saying he just does not make philosophical assertions. And of course, later on in Theravada, they have this entire scholastic monumental philosophy just full of philosophical assertions. And, um, uh, Maybe if I remember, and it seems appropriate to the conversation here, I may try and d kind of dive into that a little bit. But I mean, the main point here is you just do not cling to any point of view. So originally, and it's, this is throughout the Atikawaga, view was just view. You do not have views. DT is the Pali word. And then later on in the philosophical tradition, of Orthodox Theravada and probably a lot, most of the other schools also, DT came to be synonymous with wrong view so that when it says you shouldn't have any DT, any view, it just means you shouldn't have any wrong view. I think in, in Burmese now, even the word DT, it, it just means wrong view, even though it just literally means view, what is viewed. So let's see. Then Magandia kind of, uh, he, he, you know, it doesn't make much sense to him. So he's, he, he continues asking, well, what is this inner peace that you're talking about? And then the Buddha says this, which is another, I mean, is so un that it's, it's almost surprising that it's still included in the text. And I suppose that the, the Atikawaga was much better known and more highly regarded in ancient times in ancient India than it is today. Um, at least one of the recommended readings found on Ashokan edicts is a sutta from the, from the Sutta Nipata or from the Atikawaga. And um, I mean, it, it apparently was very well known. So they couldn't just edit it out of the Dipitaka. You know, it was, it was so old and so well regarded that they had to like reinterpret it but some of this stuff is very hard to reinterpret if um just obviously it's not theravada buddhism that is being taught here so the buddha says not by what is viewed not by what is heard not by inner knowledge nor by morality and observances is purity said to be by absence of what is viewed by absence of what is heard by non-knowledge by amorality by non-observance also not by that so having let go of these, not taking hold of anything, a peaceful one, not being dependent, would not have longings for existence. So the main point here is just not being dependent, not relying on any of this. It doesn't mean that he has no morality or no non-morality. I mean, I mean, you have to have one or the other, you would think. You'd, ha you'd either have to have a view or not have a view. So he's, he's just ruling out all of it. The Buddha is just saying it's not by view, it's not by absence of view that you become purified or enlightened. You know, it's not by morality, not by amorality. So it's not really the outward conduct. It's not even necessarily having a perception in your mind. It's just, it's the whole concept is clinging to it, believing it to be true or taking it seriously, thinking that it's going to get you enlightened or some such. And if you look at it like that, then it's getting into the realm of Orthodox Theravada. But the way he says it is clearly not Theravada. So Magandhi, of course, doesn't understand what he's talking about. He thinks that the Buddha is just being confused. And then the Buddha says, having dependent upon view inquiring, you have become confounded by what you have seized upon. And then he gets into this idea of, you know, he who imagines the existence of equal, superior, or inferior would contend with regard to that. So you have to do away with all these notions of better than or worse than or even the equal to. Um, in another sutta in the Atikawaga, all of this is called conceit. Like if you consider yourself to be superior to others or inferior to others or even equal to others, all three of those are kinds of conceit because it's, it's like self-regard. You're comparing yourself to other people, which is itself a kind of conceit. But here the Buddha is just taking it with regard to anything. And the term that's inferior 
that is translated as inferior here is nihina, which is uh, derived from hina, like in hinayana, and it just means deficient. And it's used as a like a synonym for inferior in, in Pali. So the Mahayana Buddhists really are kind of uh, using derogatory slurs in referring to pre-Mahayana Buddhism as Hinayana because it really means it's the deficient vehicle. It's the, it's the vehicle that's lacking something. So let's see. And, and here, like verse 10, I mean, it's, it's even giving some like ethical or moral instruction. Where it, says, where it says, a sage having abandoned his home, going without fixed abode, not working up intimacies in a village, rid of objects of desire, setting nothing before him, would not take up a position and make debate with the people. So that, in a way, you could call that moral instruction, even though just above, the Buddha is saying that morals aren't going to get you enlightened. But when he says morals aren't going to get you enlightened, nor is lack of morals going to get you enlightened, it's just, in a way, it it's, means like clinging to it, that the, the morals or the lack of morals, um, in a way they're almost irrelevant. So long as you let go of everything, so long as you're not clinging or relying upon anything, especially with regard to understanding the world, then you're doing okay. But once you start clinging to something, like Ajahn Chah used to say that um, even right view becomes wrong view if you cling to it. And I had a, a common... Uh, comment, I think, to the first edition or the first version, first episode of this mini series, saying that um, the teachings of the Yataka Waga do uh, resemble the teachings of Ajahn Chah to some degree. And Ajahn Chah was, he started off as a scholar monk and then just kind of got fed up with the fact that scholar monks really weren't practicing what they were preaching. And um, he, along with many other Thai Ajahns, were in a way kind of self taught. Um, the Burmese monks kind of make fun of Thai monks because the Thai monks get their poly wrong. You know, they, they misinterpret um, like philosophical terms in poly and so forth. But one advantage of that is that they are self-taught. You know, they're, they're teaching largely based on their own personal experience and not based on dogma that they have memorized from books. Like in Burma, even a relatively advanced Seattle, like Mahasi Seattle, for example, he couldn't teach anything different from what the books say because the books are like, you know, it's gospel. They can't be wrong. And so if their own personal experience deviates from what the books say, still they got to force fit their personal experience into what the books say in order to justify even saying it out loud. So, um, in the previous uh, previous uh, installment of this, I was talking about how in the Atikawaga, the lotus flower is seen as a recurring, um, like a metaphor for the saint or the, the sage, the enlightened sage, because the lotus comes out of muddy water and it's perfectly clean. You know, it's got like a non-stick surface, nothing sticks to it. So that's why it says here, just as a white lotus whose stalk arises from the water is not mired by water and mud, even so a sage, a speaker of peace, one without greed, is not mired by sensuality in the world. So this world is, is mud. It's muddy water. It's the flood that we have to cross over, according to uh, another metaphor that's very common in Buddhism. So let's see. He is not led on by what is done or heard either. He is not brought to a conclusion among entrenchments. And I should say again, like I said in the first installment, that when it's talking about you don't become purified by what is seen, nor by what is heard, nor by what is felt or through inner knowledge, the seen is like your own personal experience, like with regard to the external world. You know, what you have seen with your own eyes. You don't rely on that. And what is heard is like what you have been taught you know it's like what you have learned secondhand through teachers or scriptures or whatever you know that's not going to get you enlightened either especially if you cling to it and the inner knowledge is just like 
intuition, like the, the deep intuition stuff that comes up from inside you, um, seemingly independent of what you've seen and heard, that's not it either. You don't cling to anything. You don't cling to any of it. And part of the reason for that, even like distrusting your own, intu own intuition, is that your own thoughts, your own feelings are considered to be external to the philosophy of the Atika Waga. That is not your essence. If you have any essence at all, that's not it. That thoughts, I mean, even in Orthodox Theravada, thoughts are considered to be a kind of external thing. It's like a, a sense object. You know, it's like what you see, you see, you've got the eye, you've got the eye consciousness, and you've got the, the visual object. Those three come together, that's contact, and that creates the visual image. And it works the same even with thoughts. You've got the mind, you've got the, the mind consciousness, and then you've got the thought. And it's you, you see, you, you're aware of the thought pretty much in the same way that you're aware of a visual image out there somewhere, supposedly. That it's all considered to be a kind of external stimulus that you just become aware of, which is weird. And I can't really, I mean, it's hard for me to, to really endorse that. Although, I mean, there is some truth to it, I'm sure. Anyway, there are no ties in the final verse here. There are no ties for one dispassion toward perception. There are no confusions for one released by understanding, but those who have grabbed hold of perception and view roam through the world causing trouble. And that would include pretty much everybody, including most Buddhists and most Theravada Buddhists. If they have taken hold of perception and view, which everybody does who's unenlightened, it seems like, then they roam through the world causing trouble. They're, you know, they're having friction you know, conflict just because their view disagrees with somebody else's view because they're clinging to this view and it's a problem if something contradicts this or even tries to contradict it. So it's, you're better off just not having views. Or for an unenlightened person, someone who isn't fully enlightened yet, then, I mean, you have to have some kind of view. You have to have some kind of belief system to help you navigate through samsara, navigate through the world. But the thing is, as much as possible, you hold it in an open hand. You know, it's like a working hypothesis that you're not clinging to. You're not insisting on it. And you don't just, only this is true, because that's um, that represents the, the stereotypical fool, even in Orthodox Theravada texts. The, the, the stereotypical fool is the person who says, only this is true, anything else is wrong. Although Orthodox Theravada has kind of spun that to mean, um, you know, anything other than Orthodox Theravada. If you cling to Orthodox Theravada, then you're still doing okay, according to the later developed Orthodox tradition. So the next sutta I'm going to read is the next, next one in the Antigawaga. It's number 10, the Pura Beta Sutta. And Pura Beta literally means before the breakup. And here it's before the breakup of the body, I mean before death. And this one also is sort of back and forth between a questioner and the Buddha, although the questioner in this sutta is not specified. So it may cause a little bit of confusion when I'm reading it because um, you just have to in, l figure out from the context, you know, that this is either a question being asked of the Buddha or it's the Buddha's answers to to the questions and i like this sutta the pura beta sutta because it's 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 sort of paradoxical in a way it's it's composed a lot like the Tao Te Ching it reminds me a lot of the Tao Te Ching where the Tao Te Ching will have like paired or groups of statements that all kind of cancel each other out they're like contrasting statements that in a way, they sort of negate each other, and you're left with nothing behind. The, the Pura Beta Sutta is like that, and it has lots of puns, and there's a bit of humor in there if you look for it. And it's just kind of a light, easy to read, yet nevertheless profound sutta that I like. It's one of my favorites, although I have quite a few favorites. So, without any further ado, I will read the Pura Beta Sutta. Having what vision, having what morality is one said to be at peace? Tell me this, O Godama, you are asked about the Supreme Man. 
With craving gone before the breaking up of life, said the Blessed One, not dependent upon former times, not to be determined in the present, he has not anything set before him. Not angry, not intimidated, not boastful, not beset with worry, a speaker of discretion, not pompous, he truly is a sage whose speech is restrained. With no attachment to the future, he does not sorrow over the past. A viewer of a detachment among stimulations, he is not led into views. He is withdrawn, not a schemer, not covetous, not afraid of loss, not audacious, not beset with aversion, and not given to denigration. Not attracted to what is pleasant, and not given to contemptuousness, mild and possessed of ready wit, he is not devout, he is not impassive. He does not train himself through desire of gain, and he is not upset at lack of gain. He is not opposed to craving, nor is he greedy for, savor for savory stimulations. An indifferent onlooker, always mindful, he imagines nothing in the world to be equal, nor superior, nor lower. For him there are no distinguished positions. With whom there is no sense of dependence, having understood the way, independent. With, with whom there is not to be found craving for existence or for non-existence. Him I call at peace. Not one hoping for the objects of desire. With him there are no ties to be found. He has crossed over attachment. For him there are no sons or livestock, nor field nor property to be found. Regarding him there is not to be detected anything acquired or discarded. That for which common people would criticize him are also philosophers and holy men. He has not set that before him. Therefore he is not disturbed among criticisms. Without greed for gain, not afraid of loss. A sage does not put forth a claim as among superiors, nor as among equals, nor as among inferiors. He does not come to conception. He is without conception. He for whom there is nothing his own in the world, and who does not sorrow over what is not there, and who does not go by philosophies, he truly is said to be at peace. And that's the end of the sutta. So you may have noticed that um, it does contain a group of comparisons that in a way they're contrasting to the to the point of sort of, if not negating each, each, each other, they're sort of like neutralizing each other or balancing each other out to form a kind of neutrality or some such, which has a, an interesting effect for me anyway. And uh, let's see here. So even like the very first verse in which the Buddha is speaking, he says that uh, with craving gone before the breaking up of life, not dependent upon former times, not to be determined in the present, he has not set anything before him, or he has not anything set before him. And so obviously, not dependent upon former times is the past, not to be determined in the present is the present. And so he has not anything set before him it has like a dual meaning, and there's lots of puns in the Purabeda Sutta, lots of plays on words. So he has not anything set before him, can refer to the future, you know, because you had one line is the past, the next line is the present, and then he has not anything set before him. So that's like, you know, before him in the future. But also, um, it's sort of a, an idiom or a, a, a manner of speech in Pali to set something before you means that that is something that you consider to be high priority. You consider that to be most important. And um, it's, I've had people ask me about like in the Satipatthana Sutta or the uh, Anapana Sutta, where at the beginning it says you set mindfulness before you. And it's not referring to, you know, putting it at the tip of your nose or like, you know, six inches in front of your face or anything like that. It's just by setting mindfulness up before you, it's like that is your priority. That's what you're trying to do. And here it's the, the enlightened sage has set nothing before him. So let's see the next verse. Um, he truly is a sage whose speech is restrained in a way that's kind of a play on words because the word for sage, Muni, literally means someone who has taken a vow of silence, someone who is silent. So obviously he truly is a sage whose speech is restrained, even though in Buddhism, Muni really didn't have an implication of being mute. Although in, 
in uh, Hinduism, it still does. Someone who is maun is someone who is silent, someone who has taken a vow of silence or some such. And again, it's like with no attachment to the future, he does not sorrow over the past. This, this, the whole thing is, is set up in these contrasting statements that in a way balance each other out. And so you wind up with this kind of a, a zero. So let's see here. Oh, this next verse, number six. Um, not attracted to what is pleasant, not given to contemptuous, is mild and possessed of ready wit. He is not devout. He is not impassive. And when it says he is not devout, the, the original Pali is na sado, which sada means faith. It's usually translated as faith. And so this is one of the few texts in, in Buddhism, in Theravada Buddhism, that is implying that a monk or even a anyone seeking wisdom, anyone trying to become enlightened, has no faith. The only other verse that I can think of where um, it's saying that you should have no faith is, it's in the Dhammapada, and it's, uh, the whole verse is puns. And uh, I don't have, I don't have it here on hand, so I can't tell you what verse number it is. But um, it also says a monk should have, or the supreme man, the highest of men, should have no sada or faith. So, it's, it's, it's kind of strange, although there are, there are some Western monks especially who don't like the word faith. It smacks too much of Christianity or just kind of blind belief, you know, dogmatic belief or something. You just believe it because the book says so. So they will replace it with something like confidence. Although, in this case, it probably does just mean faith, and you, you're not supposed to have any of that. You know, faith is, in a way, it's like a clinging to a belief. You know, you believe it even though the evidence may not support it, you know. So, yes, it is, I mean, that's, that's another pre-Theravadan element of these suttas. And then the, the next one also is just kind of, I mean, it's just like heresy from a Theravadan point of view. He does not train himself through desire of gain. He does. He is not upset at lack of gain, which is standard. But then it says, he is not opposed to craving, nor is he greedy for savory stimulations. So, he is not opposed to craving. I mean, that's just, I mean, some some devout Theravadans would just think you'd go to hell for believing that even though it's, it's here in an extremely ancient Theravada Buddhist text, possibly the largest chunk of really archaic, primitive, primitive Buddhism still in existence, unless there's some, you know, buried underground in some inscription that hasn't been discovered yet. But the word for craving is tana, which literally means thirst. So literally, it's he is not opposed to thirst. Avirudo cha tanaya. And then the next verse is, nor is he greedy for savory stimulations. And the word for savory stimulations is rasa. So that means, literally means flavor. So you can say, he's not opposed to thirst, nor is he greedy for flavors. Which, you know, it's kind of comparing drinking with eating, I guess. But it's pretty clear that it has a dual meaning. You know, not only is he not obsessed with food or like, you know, clinging to the to food, you know, attached to food, but it probably really does say he is not opposed to craving because to be opposed to something, you're setting yourself up in a position, you're clinging to this anti-view and that's not going to get you enlightened. That is a hindrance. As long as you're clinging to anything, you can be clinging to saintliness. You can be clinging to the concept of enlightenment or something, clinging to your desire for enlightenment. It's still clinging and eventually it's going to have to be let go. So another, the very next one, you know, it's, it's uh, reiterating what was said in the previous sutta. You know, he imagines nothing in the world to be equal, no sur nor superior, nor lower. And then it says, for him, there are no distinguished positions. And that is another kind of a, a, a pun or a play on words. There's lots of them in the sutta, which makes it difficult to translate when you have to come up with an English equivalent that has the same multiple meanings as the Pali. So what I've uh, translated as distinguished positions is usada, which literally means like an, uh, a hill or an eminence, something that protrudes upwards. 
And like on the, the standard list of the, the, the weird list of the 32 marks of the, the superior man, you know, he's got like these eminences on his body. Like he's got like one between his shoulder blades, I think. And, um, but here clearly it means like a distinguished position, something that you consider to be higher than something else, including yourself. You know, you don't want to consider yourself to be superior to others, even though you may be like really an advanced saint or something. It's, it's, you just don't cling to any of that. You don't compare yourself to anything. You don't even think of, of even having a self, but it, you don't think of having not a self either, which is coming up here soon. So he has no craving for existence or non-existence. And okay, verse 11. And this is just getting into some of the standard, like ethical instructions that, I mean, it's not going to get you enlightened if you cling to it. And the absence of it's not going to get you enlightened so long as you, you have a version for it or have a clinging to being agnostic or something. But here it says, regarding him, there is not to be detected anything acquired or discarded. And this is a Lulu of a pun because anything acquired or discarded is atamwa pi niratamwa. And it's, I mean, ata can also mean self and nirata can also mean non-self or no self. Usually the term for no self in Pali is anatta, but nirata has the same meaning. It's not used much at all, but it has the same meaning or it can. Here though, ata is a past participle of a verb like adiyadi, which means to take, to acquire. And uh, see, where is it? Nirata. Nirata. It's a past participle of something, I think it's nirajadi, which means to discard. So literally, it means he has nothing acquired or discarded, but it's pretty obvious that considering that it, I mean, the exact same words could be interpreted as self or no self, it would also mean he has no clinging to self, he has no clinging to not self, which may be grasped or, or like seized upon by monks who really insist that the Buddha taught that there is some kind of immortal soul or a genuine self. But um, yeah, it's, it says no self, no not self. You don't cling to, to either extreme, which uh, may be the origin of the whole concept of no self. That um, this discouraging that you cling to the idea of a self may have been interpreted as you just don't have a self. Whereas, I mean, it may be that like this verse, which is extremely old, may be the origin of, or part of the origin of the whole idea where it's saying you don't cling to a self, you don't cling to a not self. You know, you don't cling to self or no self. You just don't cling to any of it. No philosophical views whatsoever. You don't cling to any of that. So that's, that's like an important statement, I think. It may be one of the most philosophically significant statements in this book, even though it's in the form of a pun or a play on words. So let's see, the next verse, um, I've contemplated this a lot and I've tried to use it in my own life, especially when I was a monk. It's like that for which common people would criticize him or also philosophers and holy men, he has not set that before him. Therefore, he is not disturbed among criticisms. And, um, the philosophers and holy men here that I've translated as philosophers and holy men, that's samanas and brahmanas. So the samanas are the non, the non Hindu or the non Vedic ascetic wanderers mostly. And the, the holy men are the brahmins. So that was like the, the standard pair of the, the religious figures in ancient India, ancient Northern India. You had the, the samanas and the brahmanas, you know, the, the Vedic holy men and the non Vedic philosophers. But um, this text, I mean, it's, it could be interpreted in different ways. And I, I used to wrangle with it, trying to use it to my advantage, I think, in that, you know, you do not set before you. And again, we're using the set before you. This is not referring to the future. This is just like, you know, having considering something to be important and anything that you'd be criticized over, you just don't consider it to be important. And so, I mean, that can be abused, I think. Maybe I've abused it before, but... Um, I did try to live up to this and, uh, it did get me into trouble more than once, I think. So let's see, 
Without greed for gain, not afraid of loss, a sage does not put forth a claim among superiors, nor as among equals, nor as among inferiors. He does not come to conception, he is without conception. So again, it's like the, the recurring refrain in the Antigawaga. You don't consider yourself to be superior or inferior or equal, and you don't consider even philosophical beliefs to be superior or inferior or equal. You know, it's just samsara. You know, it's all just something that you're trying to detach from. It's something you, you shouldn't take seriously because when you take it seriously, it just sticks to you. And this word conception here, it's a word that's found a lot in the Antikawaga. It's something that you don't cling to at all. And the, the Pali word is kappa. And kappa can have various meanings, but here it is, means like concept or it, it's almost a, a synonym for perception. Or like idea um, in the the noble eightfold path one of the uh, one of the the steps of the noble eightfold path is sama sankapa which is usually translated as right thought and sankapa is just kappa with an intensifying prefix added onto it it means almost exactly the same thing and then finally you get to the last verse here he for whom there is nothing his own in the world and who does not sorrow over what is not there and who does not go by philosophies, he truly is said to be at peace. And who does not sorrow over what is not there. I think that's an important thing to, to stress that you're not suffering over literally nothing. You know, what you're sorrowing over what is not there. It's like, um, it could be interpreted in, in various ways. It's like, you know, let's say you're hungry and you're a monk and you're not going to eat anything until, you know, tomorrow morning at the earliest, you know, you're not going to be troubled by that because the, the food is not there. Or it could be like, maybe you're afraid of ghosts and there aren't any ghosts, but you think maybe one might show up at any minute. Again, you're suffering over literally nothing because there's nothing there. It's just all self-generated suffering. And ultimately in Buddhism, all suffering is self-inflicted. I mean, it's just going with the idea of self for the sake of convenience here. But it's all just auto-generated. And then finally, um, the last non Theravadan Lulu here. And who does not go by philosophies? And the word that I translated as philosophy is Dhamma. So he does not go by Dhamma. So Dhamme, Dhamme Su Cha Nat Gachadi. So that would, that would be the Pali. So he doesn't go by or go among Dhammas. And it's pretty clear that Dhammas in the plural is referring to philosophical systems or spiritual systems. You know, it's like the Jains had their, their Dhamma, the Buddhists had their Dhamma, different sects of Buddhism, which eventually rose, you know, had their own, you know, distinct interpretation of Dhamma anyway. You know, the, the, the Vedic, you know, proto-Hindus had their Dhammas and um, you know the ajivakas and so forth and uh, it's all called dhamma and again according to the the orthodox interpretation i mean that just means wrong dhammas you know you just don't follow wrong dhammas you don't you don't cling to wrong beliefs you know you don't have wrong perceptions so they just take all this you don't cling to perceptions as was they're just saying well you know it's you can cling to the Theravada stuff. And that's not what it's saying. If you take it literally, you're not supposed to believe anything. You're not supposed to cling to anything. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's just such a, a scary, I mean, really, it's kind of a scary way of going about life or even trying to go about life in that in not clinging to anything, not, not harboring any kind of beliefs, not having faith in anything. It's just like empty space. And you can't really set up a kind of uh, viable spiritual system based on that because, I mean, <sighs> there's nothing to cling to. And most people that follow spiritual systems are unenlightened. You know, they, they need to cling to something. And uh, so it kind of brings about the whole idea of why this is so different from Orthodox Theravada. And I think there's two main possibilities. 
I've mentioned this in the, in the previous installment, but I may as well mention it again because it is kind of important. Why would the oldest text be this kind of mind-blowingly paradoxical and advanced? And then it kind of gets easier and less enlightened, presumably, um, later on in the established system. And I think there's sort of a, a charitable, like a, a valid explanation and then kind of a not so good explanation. And I'm not sure exactly which it is. It could be a combination of the two. But as I mentioned, oh, I probably forgot to mention one of the evidences that this is really ancient, the Atikawaga, is that it really is directed towards very advanced people, which is another reason why the, the Brahmin father with the teenage daughter, I mean, that may be just sort of a, a later addition to the sutta. Um, another thing I forgot to mention See, I, I forget to mention stuff. I should write all this down. Is um, the very beginning of the, the Magandhya Sutta here, if I can find it. The very first line, having seen craving, dissatisfaction, and passion, there did not occur even an inclination to sexuality. That's what the Buddha says right before calling the, 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 teenage, the beautiful teenage girl an it full of urine and dung. You know, he says, having seen craving, dissatisfaction, and passion, there did not occur even an inclination to sexuality. Well, this craving, dissatisfaction, and passion, or maybe it'd be come closer to call it craving, insatiability, and passion, are the names of the three daughters of Mara, the Buddhist devil. The Buddhist, you know, the Buddhist cosmic bad guy has three daughters named Tahna, Aradi, and Raga. Tahna is craving. Um, Aradi is just sort of like not being satisfied, you know, being insatiable. And raga is usually uh, translated as lust or passion. And it could be that this is a little bit of mythology added as intro to this really ancient text. And that happens a lot. You can have uh, Buddhist suttas that, you know, they've got like a core of really ancient stuff. And then like later stuff gets added to it. And probably if I continue, I probably will continue with this little series on studies in archaic Buddhism. A classic example would be the Saka Panya Sutta, where it's got the core of the sutta is really ancient, you know, possibly as old as the Ataka Waga. And then the beginning and the end are just like weird mythology that's got tacked on later, almost certainly. And so that could be the case with this, or it could be that the three daughters of Mara and their names are derived just from this, because it doesn't say that there's any daughters of Mara here. It just says, having seen craving, dissatisfaction, and passion, there did not occur even an inclination to sexuality. So it could be that he was just, uh, you know, observing craving, dissatisfaction, and passion, and uh, still it didn't, he wasn't uh, turned on at all or some such. But that could be... Um, so there's two interpretations of this too. I mean, it could be just non-mythological that got became like the, the seed crystal for this whole idea that Mara had three daughters with these names that tried to tempt him on the night of his enlightenment. Or it could just be that, uh, um, that it just got added on later. But as I was starting to say before I digressed, before I digressed again, um, this Brahmin father of the teenage daughter. I mean, this is another indication that maybe the beginning of this sutta is not as old as the rest of it, because as I was saying, the Atika Waga in general is directed towards advanced veteran livers of the holy life. Like the Buddha's first converts were in all likelihood mostly composed of people that were already homeless wanderers. You know, they're looking for a good teacher. They're out there in the forest looking for a good teacher. They hear of this philosopher named Gotama. They go to him and he teaches them what, you know, deep down they know they need to hear. And so it wasn't until later on that he started becoming more popular, more famous and attracting like beginners. And so when you're attracting beginners, you can't teach them this kind of stuff because it's, it's, like being a fish out of water. They're just gasping for something. They, they need something they can kind of grasp because they're just not ready to let go of the entire world. And so he had to make it easy or easier for the beginners. You know, I'm sure he must have 
ordained monks even not just meeting with lay people but but meeting or like ordaining monks that he just knew they just weren't right for enlightenment yet they were just uh, still relatively beginners and so it may be that later on in his sasana his uh, dispensation you know his ministry he had to make like more elementary instructions for that people could follow and just kind of sort of grasp it in their mind that kind of a thing so that's sort of the charitable explanation on why uh the oldest texts are relatively way more advanced than a lot of stuff you find later on or later texts in theravada buddhism and then of course the the less charitable explanation is that you just had monks like scholar monks that really weren't so much into meditating they just wanted to like be teachers and you know they wanted to philosophize and you can't philosophize when it says you shouldn't even have beliefs so they just sort of backed away from the abyss you know it's scary they had to back away from the cliff's edge and then they started coming up with philosophies for justifying backing away from the cliff's edge and then eventually a buddhist philosopher named nagarjuna led his followers to the cliff's edge again and then shortly afterwards i mean it's just so scary so so anti-human nature in a sense you know so completely radically anti-samsaric that then the mahayana buddhists had to back away from the cliff also but um those are the the charitable and the the uncharitable possibilities it could be a combination of the two i would assume that it would be both that especially the devotionalism I don't think the Buddha would be sitting around bragging in grandiose terms about how wonderful he was and how people should worship him and so forth like you can find in, in some texts. Um, so there is that. And uh, before I finish here, we're already gone for, going for an hour. It's just time flies when you're having fun, I suppose. Um, some people, after the first installment of this uh, little mini-series, um, have asked me how to obtain a copy of the Atika Waga, of, of my translation in particular, I suppose. And uh, there are two ways of going about it, the digital way and then the hard copy paper way. The digital way, there's lots of places where you can find the Atika Waga in translation on the internet. Not only my translation, but Ajahn Tanisaro, I'm sure, has translated the whole thing. I think probably Bhikkhu Bodhi. And, and they're two of the best translators of a poly into English. So, I mean, it's out there. If you want my translation in particular, I know of at least two places where you can find it. One is on my languishing old website, nipapancha.org, N-I-P-P-A-P-A-N-C-A.org, where there is um, a, like a, a digital version of this, which also has the appendices or the appendixes whichever is, is more correct about one of them is the, the list of the reasons why the Atagawaga appears to be so very uh, ancient. And the other one is excerpts from the Parayana Waga, which is approximately as old as the Atagawaga, except for the intro and the conclusion, which like the Magandya Sutta might be, like the Sakapanya Sutta probably, very probably is, it's, you got this nucleus of very ancient stuff, and then you've got like later mythological stuff added at the beginning and the end. So if you wanted a paper, oh, I'm confused myself here. So there's nipapancha.org. And then also I have been told that there are at least two different versions of my translation um, that are linked to the Wikipedia article on the Atikawaga. So if you, if you look up Atikawaga on, on Wikipedia, there may be, um, I have been told that there are links to at least two of my versions, an earlier one and a later one. And they're almost exactly the same. Um, but if you want a paper version, which would be this, I tried to make this version of it small enough to fit into a pocket, although it's still a little bit too big. Eventually, I would like to, to have published like a really small version that you can just keep in your pocket and just pull out. And you're sitting on a, in a park somewhere and you just want to read that uh, it would be convenient for that. But I do have quite a few copies of this. And if someone sends me their mailing address, I can send them a copy. But 
with regard to the fancy edition, the path press edition that uh, got aborted after after making like the original copies and then but if you want to know the story of that and it's it's in part one of this little series but um yeah i only have like two copies of this left so i'm not going to be sending them to people but this little one that i had uh i made it in america one of my first trips back to america after i became a monk and, and went to burma and it does have a few typos in the poly side, but most of you probably can't read poly anyway. So that's, that's it. So I guess that's the end. I may have forgotten something important again, but this is going to be the, uh, the one that gets uploaded on YouTube and BitChute. And uh, I am on BitChute, and you're probably better off um, watching videos on BitChute if they're there than YouTube because YouTube is going Orwellian. So, uh, without any further ado, I'm just going to say, be happy.